Hello and welcome to the Daily Space for Monday, August 13 of 2018. I am your host, Dr. Andres Plazas. And uh, as always, we're going to bring you a roundup of today's news from space and astronomy. For today, I have uh, two stories, two main stories. Um, we're going to talk about the sun, now that we've been talking about Parker's Probe being launched. And I'm going to talk about neutrinos and something called Lorentz invariance. That sounds cool. So let's dive in with the first story of today regarding the sun and the solar cycles. So in this story that I want to talk about uh, first, um, scientists have discovered an underlying and repeatable pattern in uh, how the space weather activity changes with the solar cycle. So they actually analyzed the uh, solar activity for the last half century, for the last 50 years. And uh, this is something that of course that will allow us to a better understanding and planning for the space weather and any future threats to the communications or anything uh, related um, to the technology of the Earth. Um, as we know, the Earth uh, near space plasma environment is highly dynamic and it has some space weather. And this space weather can impact uh, electrical um, networks, it can create power loss, aviation disruption, interrupt communications, uh, disturbance to satellites. And the drivers of these space weather are the sun of course the sun itself and the solar wind and um, the response uh, that we see here on earth um, we have been monitoring this almost continuously for more than uh, 50 years in the in the last century um, each of the lights of the last uh, five solar maxima that uh, they have studied in this um, in this uh, paper uh, has a different duration and a peak activity level and um, there are certain uh, variations however the researchers here have found that there are some aspects of this weather that are in fact uh, reproducible and uh, you can actually infer that from um, a study in previous solar maxima um, so we know that the sun goes through solar activities, uh, solar cycles around in about uh, every 11 years and uh, during this time the number of sunspots increases to a maximum point so this is what we call the solar maximum and uh, in conjunction with this more solar activity means more solar flares which in turn can mean more uh, mass ejections, for example, or more extreme space uh, weather on Earth. And um, what they have done in this research, uh, the, the scientists said, is that they have analyzed the last five solar maxima and found that uh, even though the overall likelihood of more extreme events changes from one solar maxima to another, there is an underlying pattern to this likelihood, which in fact doesn't change. So looking a little bit deeper into the paper, um, we find out that uh, they analyzed uh, the distribution, uh, the statistical distribution of uh, these solar events. And uh, they actually looked at the outliers, which is um, those events that are uh, extreme compared to the rest. When you look at the statistical distribution, if you look at what we call the tail of the distribution, those are those events that are kind of away from what the rest are doing and those are the type of events that we're interested in, the events that can be more extreme. Uh, in this paper the researchers have looked at that tail of that distribution and uh, they have isolated it and then have found out that you could uh, use another well-described mathematical distribution just to describe that tail. And this is good because once we have found that uh, the tail of the distribution follows another mathematical distribution, that means that we can that we have found a pattern. And uh, if we know certain parameters of that uh, new distribution of that distribution of streams, parameters such as the mean or the the dispersion, then we are able to understand the behavior of these types of extreme events 
in a predictable manner. And um, so the researchers point out that if this is a pattern that, that persists into the next solar maximum, for example, this type of research could constrain how likely these large events are, as I said, by understanding this distribution. And this will in turn allow for a better preparation for a potential space weather threats to, to the Earth. And um, yeah, well, these uh, more extreme events, of course, are less frequent and they are harder to build up a statistical picture of how likely they occur. So um, it is important to uh, at least have a mathematical tool to try to predict and better understand uh, these uh, type of uh, events uh, that will be more important for us here on Earth. So that was the yeah the first story that I wanted to talk about regarding the sun and related to the Parker Prof. And actually, it was Eugene Parker who uh, many decades ago first proposed uh, about the solar wind actually and the space weather. And um, okay, but then the second story that I wanted to mention in today's daily space has to do with neutrinos, as I mentioned. And um, and the ice cube collaboration, and then something called Lotus invariance. So so what is this? So the existence of neutrinos. It was first postulated about in the 30s, in, in the 1930s, and um, the, these tiny particles that uh, they almost interact with nothing on Earth uh, or with matter in general. Uh, they were proposed to explain an apparent vi violation of the law of the conservation of, of energy. Um, but now in this uh, research that I want to talk about, the ice cube collaboration has used neutrinos uh, seen in their detector to test uh, something that is called the Lorentz invariance, which is actually uh, one of the cornerstones of um, what we call the special theory of uh, of relativity um, posited by Albert Einstein in 1905. So um, in more general terms, this Lorentz symmetry is named after a Dutch uh, physicist called Hendrik Lorentz. Um, it's telling us uh, that um, every law of physics is, is stays the same for all observers that are moving with respect to one another in what we call an inertial frame. So what does that mean in, in other words? So it, this is a principle that states that the laws of physics are independent of the speed and orientation of the experimenter's frame of reference. And uh, this is um, one of the fundamentals of um, um, Einstein's uh, special theory of relativity, the other fundamental being the constancy of the speed of light uh, no matter uh, in which uh, frame of reference you are. So we mentioned this because then it is important to question this assumption. So the special theory of relativity of course has passed uh, experimental tests throughout the decades. Um, however, in the in the recent decades, particularly at the end of the um, of the um, of the end of the last decade of the last uh, century of the 90s, uh, some some physicists, sometimes scientists, have started to question the, the validity of this Lorentz invariance uh, because of the possibility that it could be broken in a slightly new theories of fundamental physics, such as uh, a string theory. And therefore, over the past two decades, researchers have tested the validity of Lorentz invariance in the different situations. Um, in this particular scenario, the ice cube collaboration have used neutrinos. And neutrinos, they, as I said, they almost interact with nothing in the universe. They do interact uh, uh, with um, matter through what we call the weak force by definition, which is one of the four fundamental forces uh, of nature, uh, along with gravity, electromagnetism, and the strong nuclear force. Uh, but the, the influence of this weak force, and hence the name, is limited to very small distances. And as a consequence, as a result, interactions between neutrinos and matter are very extremely improbable. And uh, 
therefore a neutrino can easily tra uh, traverse the entirety of Earth uh, without almost interacting with anything. Uh, then, of course, we want to build a detector that detects something that is almost undetectable. So, uh, there is a paradox, but there is something that we can do. Then we can actually uh, create a large volume of detectors. In this case, the Ice Groove um, a Neutrino Observatory is located in the South Pole and um, it has a large area of uh, detectors that are more than about 5,000 light sensors and they are focused on one cubic kilometer or about one billion ton tons of ice and these sensors are constantly looking for interactions for flashes of light that are produced as a consequence of a neutrino uh, colliding with a particle of ice so we have a low probability of interaction but we have a lot of mass to counteract for it and um, in general, um, actually a few weeks ago, or maybe um, a few months ago, we mentioned that the Ice Cube Neutrino Observatory had detected uh, one very, very high neutrino event from a blazer, and this is actually the, one of the main goals of this collaboration. But in this case, you can use the data of the neutrino, of the Ice Cube Neutrino collaboration to test something as fundamental as, as Lorentz uh, invariance. So, um, actually how how did they do it so we need to back up a little bit and then remember that uh, in the standard model of particle physics we have three types <laughs> of uh, neutrinos one is called the electron neutrino the other one is called the mu neutrino and the other one is called the tau neutrino and uh, when particles with cosmic rays interact with the atmosphere of the earth most of the uh, most of the interactions are going to produce neutrinos of the type uh, of the tau neutrino. So most of the neutrinos that are produced in the atmosphere uh, are mu neutrinos. I'm sorry, I said tau neutrino is actually mu neutrinos. So those are the type of neutrinos that are produced in the atmosphere. And um, the atmospheric neutrinos that are generated around the globe, they travel freely through the South Pole but there is something very cool that is called neutrino oscillation which means that neutrinos along the way can change the type and that is to say if you have a mu neutrino you can end up detecting something called um, uh, something uh, like a tau neutrino and uh, so the basic idea of this is actually as you can see in the in the picture on your screen is that uh, you have a neutrino a mu neutrino generated on the atmosphere on the other side of the earth and then you have your detector on the south pole and then you want to see if you have detected something different than a mu neutrino and it turns out uh, backing up a little bit more that uh, this type of oscillation is possible in quantum mechanics because actually this type of electron neutrino, mu neutrino and tau neutrino um, when you observe a neutrino they're actually a co combination a quantum probability combination of these different types of neutrino so um, this is something like when you hear in popular culture talking about Schrodinger's cat that the cat might be alive and dead at the same time until you observe it um, in quantum mechanics you have something called the wave function which is something uh, it's a mathematical construct and um, everything that you're going to observe in the universe has this particular wave option and there is a certain set of possible outcomes and for each of those outcomes there is a certain probability or weight associated and in the end the wave function is a sum of those outcomes but you don't know what's going to happen until you observe the um, actual experiment so until you make an observation then you have what you call the collapse of the wave function and then one of those possibilities is going to materialize in your observation so this is the, um, the standard interpretation that we have of quantum mechanics physicists that are already are, are still debating whether this is the most adequate interpretation it's called the Copenhagen interpretation after the capital of Denmark when 100 years ago people gathered together to try to figure out what quantum mechanics was uh, but then coming back to our story of today if we have an 
neutrino that is a combination of this type of neutrinos. You can think of each one of these combinations of having an associated wavelength to it uh, from the uh, duality that you have in quantum mechanics and that's what is depicted actually in the um, in in the in the graph that uh, that you're observing right now on your on your screen so in a simple approximation um, relevant to to this experiment uh, you can think of the birth of a mu neutrino in the atmosphere as the simultaneous production of two quantum mechanical waves or two quantum mechanical states in the wave function one is a new let's call it the neutrino v2 and the other one is the neutrino number three and actually that's uh, the nomen nomenclature that they use and uh, these waves are actually you have two waves they are observing the detector as a mu neutrino or would be observing a detector as a mu neutrino if the phase is the waves the two waves are in phase that is if the two peaks of the waves are of the if the peaks of the two waves actually coincide however and uh, on the other hand you would observe a tau neutrino if you have waves that are if you have out waves that are out of phase that is to say the peak of one wave uh, falls or corresponds to the throat of the or the valley of the other wave okay coming back to our main story if neutrinos did not have uh, any mass if they were massless and uh, the Lorentz invariance held exactly the two waves would actually travel in unison and they would actually always maintain a phase uniformity so then we have these two variables if the neutrinos have a certain mass then we would have this type of neutrino oscillation and actually this is how people uh, back in 2000s they found out about this type of neutrino oscillations assuming Lorentz invariance they found out that uh, uh, neutrinos actually are not massless but they have a mass but the researchers in this particular article they point out that um, the oscillations resulting from the mass differences in this particular experiment are expected to be negligible so the only variable that's left uh, are the energies that they are analyzing because this is something that is going to depend on the energies of the, of the neutrinos so if we don't care about the oscillation of the masses then the other, other variable that we want to study is uh, uh, a breaking up of the Lorentz assumption the Lorentz uh, invariance therefore if we see any oscillation uh, at this particular energy at this particular wavelengths then uh, that would indicate that we have some sort of Lorentz invariance and um, so the ice cube collaboration is not the first group to seek for this type of Lorentz invariance in neutrino oscillations however they, uh, they there are two key factors that have allowed the authors to carry out the most precise search so far so the first one is that uh, as i said before the atmospheric neutrinos that are produced on the opposite of the earth of the detector well they are produced on the other side of the earth as i just said and they travel a large distance which is about two times is the, the diameter of the earth which is about 13000 kilometers before being observed and this is this maximizes the probability that a potential oscillation will occur and then the second factor is that the la um, the large size of the detector allows the neutrinos to be observed that have a much higher energies than those that could be seen in other experiments so for this particular type of energies um, if the higher you have the higher in quantum mechanics the higher you have the energy of a particle that means the smaller the wavelength of the particle um, the, the smaller the wavelength of that particle is so um, how small so they point out that uh, you can prove tiny wavelengths down to less than one billionth of the width of an atom um, and the result is that the ice cube collaboration did not see any sign of oscillations and uh, they have therefore inferred that the peaks of the two waves associated with the creation of the of the neutrino are shifted by no more than this distance again one billionth of the width of an atom after traveling the diameter of the earth 
uh, therefore the speeds of the waves they differ by no more than a few parts per 10 to the 28th which is a humongous number and uh, this therefore makes the result one of the most precise uh, speeds comparisons in history and in particular the, the um, constraints on this type of Lorentz invariance and well, these results are already impressive, uh, however, um, there is still more potential to, to know more. And um, because of uh, the limited type of data that they had, the authors have restricted their attention to violations that are independent of the direction of the neutrino propagation. That is something else that we also want to test, that we have a, a violation of I, um, isotropy. And um, this is something that is another type of violation or another type of condition that could be violated uh, because we also um, assume and we have also tested experimentally that the laws of physics do not change depending on the direction that you observe and these statements may sound trivial to you but actually statements such as the laws of physics do not change depending on the direction where you observe or the laws of physics do not change depending on whether you do your experiment here or on the moon, they translate into something that is called translation invariance or rotational invariance, and therefore um, you can translate this type of statements into conservation laws. Then you have, for example, the conservation of linear momentum when you consider the translation invariance. Then you have the conservation of angular momentum when you consider the, the rotational invariance. And these uh, conservation laws are one of the more important principles in, in physics. And there's a mathematical theorem by a physicist called Emily Nether that tells us all about symmetry in nature and conservation laws. And um, this is all related, no? the Lorentz invariance and the symmetries uh, underline the, the fundamental laws of physics. Physicists in general, they look for symmetry in their equations, for elegance. Uh, it is a guiding principle, however, it should not be a blinding guiding principle because we should take into account um, that in the end, of course, it is the experiment who's going to tell us what actually nature is doing. So just because some equation is elegant and beautiful and symmetrical that doesn't necessarily mean that uh, that's how physics works um, and I say this because this is nowadays for example that we're looking for a theory that unifies quantum mechanics and general relativity we're going to a string theory that is beautiful and elegant and logically consistent but in the end we still need to have experimental verification um, well, however, general relativity and special relativity, they do satisfy these principles of symmetry, of elegance, if you, wish, if you will. And uh, it is always important to try to um, test and always uh, uh, challenge experimentally the validity of these assumptions, in particular this part, uh, assumption of Lorentz invariance. Um, and I think that I have bubbled uh, a lot <laughs> for for today eh, with this story, so I'm gonna go ahead and uh, look at your uh, your comments, uh, everyone. Do you have any questions or any comments? Uh, hello, everyone. Ed Thompson, Radio Geek, Paranor, Tom Van Scooter. Hello. Hello, Guido, DPI, hey Larry, Adam all together, talking about Pixel, all right. Uh, hello, Nightbot, the Nightbot is always there. Hello, <laughs> uh, Honey. So Honey is asking us about the sun. Can they connect the stream events to actually f to actual phenomena on the sun, like this pattern on the surface? means shield or your power grid uh, okay so they're asking me if the well yeah the actually the the parameters that they observed they were actually observables sorry for the redundance they were observables on on the sun itself like uh, 
uh, electric fields or the strength of the coronal ejections and um, I briefly looked at the abstract of the paper and didn't look at the actual uh, uh, plots of the paper because it was behind a paywall so I guess I have to go around that but uh, um, they did mention in the abstract that they were uh, doing um, a statistical distribution, they were analyzing a statistical distributions of actual physical properties of the earth and then as I mentioned uh, what I was describing this story is that they look at the tail of these distributions and were able to come up with a new mathematical distribution that could describe the tail of those distributions or those extreme events that uh, we care about so uh, we could certainly correlate um, the more likelihood if we have more probability of a particular type of uh, physical parameter to happen uh, some mass ejection or something like that then uh, we should uh, actually be able to also correlate that with how we should be prepared here on, on the earth for, for that and this is part of the uselessness of uh, this study so Larry said Lawrence invariance and um, no, it's not Lawrence, it's uh, Lawrence, so that's, um, that was probably my accent. So I'm going to spell it out for you. It would be L-O-R-E-N-T-Z, Lawrence, more or less. And the name of the physicist is Hendrik Lawrence, and he was, uh, yeah, he was at the turn of the century. He was very fundamental with... Uh, um, he was very fundamental for Einstein and Einstein got a lot of inspiration from him to start thinking about the effects of uh, special relativity. One of the things actually, it's not that Einstein came out with this out of the blue. Like for example, Lorentz was already starting to think about the effect of length uh, contraction and actually you find something called the Lorentz contraction in a special relativity when you start uh, traveling close to the speed of, of light. Uh, then Hani uh, pointed out that it's actually Lorentz. Thank you very much. Hi Uncle Bill. Uh, um, I haven't heard anything, partner says, I haven't heard anything more from the potential detection of esteroidal neutrinos. Uh, I haven't either. Maybe I should check more. Uh, Larry went ahead and looked at the Wikipedia article for Lorentz invariance. That's great. In non critical string theory. All right. And. Um, this work about the neutrinos validate or invalidate a string theory well this particular work is trying to look for validations uh, I'm sorry for violations in Lorentz invariance and uh, the press released in, in Nature this is um, uh, an article that appeared in Nature Physics Nature News in, in, yeah, Nature Physics in particular and they mentioned that some uh, uh, variations of string theory um, imply or I don't know if predict or assume certain violations of uh, Lorentz invariance and uh, that's uh, all I know with the respect to that matter and I do believe that they have some uh, citations in the, um, in the Nature article and then it would be interesting to know what particular aspects of uh, of Lorentz symmetry they these theories predict. Um, so Hani is asking, what is happening in the image? How many neutrinos do you have to shoot to see one? Well, that's a good question. I don't have the exact numbers. I know it's a lot, and as I said, it's because the cross section of the uh, the cross section or the probability of interaction of the neutrinos with matter is very small, and um, certainly there are or the orders of millions or even billions of neutrinos passing through us right now, and. Um, in the um, ice cube collaboration, actually, depending on the energy that you're looking at, then you're going to have a certain number of events. And uh, 
for example, in the news that we were talking about the other day, well, the other day, like uh, some weeks ago, about this very high energy neutrino. It was the number of neutrinos that they detected, I think it was like one or two, because they had such a high energy. If you lower your threshold in energy, then you're expecting to see, of course, more neutrinos, but um, of the orders of maybe tens or I'm speculating right now, maybe hundreds uh, at, out of the billions that actually come and, and interact. And uh, the cartoon that uh, is uh, sh uh, being shown on your screen, um, it was just a cartoon meant to show that how the neutrinos, uh, the mu neutrinos are created on the atmosphere on one side of the Earth. And then you can think of any particular neutrino as a combination of different, um, different waves, like a different um amplitude probabilities are called and they were saying that uh, if you have a particular mu neutrino or a, or a particular neutrino let's say um you can think of it to have two waves associated to it and in the end if you go back in your detector and those waves are still in phase that is to say that the peaks have not moved through to the to the valleys then you're going to see a mu neutrino if the, if, the, if the waves are still in phase. If you find any difference in the phase, then you're going to see another type of neutrino, and then you're going to detect uh, the, uh, the phenomenon of neutrino oscillations. And this is the type of thing that they were trying to find, um, a different type of neutrino oscillations. And then they mentioned there could be two things why you could have neutrino oscillation, because the neutrinos are no, not massless, and people found this out. People already found this out, the, the neutrino, they do have a mass that is different from zero. And this is, was a big deal back in the 2000 when they figured this out because the standard model of particle physics up to that moment was assuming that neutrinos did not have any mass and therefore were traveling at the speed of light. They did find out that neutrinos have a little bit of, of mass. But then... Uh, there is another detail that in this article they said that uh, that uh, particular uh, the contribution of the mass of the neutrinos to the oscillation here is not that important and therefore the other parameter that remains is uh, Lorentz invariance because they say that the other way that you can have uh, the two waves going out of phase is if you have some Lorentz invariance which they did not find Emily Nether, yes. Honey, yes. Uh, honey, uh, Larry, maybe in another universe. Yeah, the the string landscape has 10 to the 500 possibilities of universes. Fenric, does that mean that all neutrinos are in superposition of three quantum states, electron, muon, tau, and that each has its own wave function with a slightly different frequency? So uh, there is just one wave function, and uh, the neutrino, tau, and uh, muon, these are called a different, let's say, flavors, and they actually are each, each of each of them has a certain weight associated to them and the actual wave function of the final neutrino that we're going to the final neutrino that lives in the abstract in the in the, in the world of the of the wave function is a li is what we call in mathematics a linear combination of those possibilities and in the end um, so each possibility has a certain probability amplitude and in the end uh, we're going when we observed when we perform our experiment, we're going to do what we call the collapse of the wave function, and we're going to observe um, one result or, or the other. Um, the standard model particles have mass because of the Higgs boson, but uh, if it doesn't give mass to neutrinos, is the mass coming from the switching from one type to another? Um, that I'm not sure. I actually, it was my understanding that actually the Higgs boson was... Um, 
yeah i that's actually i i don't know because as far as i um of my understanding goes is that um, the classical standard model of particle physics was assuming that you neutrinos did not have any mass i don't know exactly how it was maybe updated if uh, after uh, because i know this observation of, neut of neutrino oscillation happened in like the year 2000 or something like that and then actually years later um, the scientists were given the Nobel Prize because of this uh, experiment and then I don't know exactly how that uh, makes logical consistency then with the finding of the Higgs boson or the mechanism that gives mass to all the particles in the in the standard um, uh, in this st in the standard model of particle physics uh, the masses I do know they figured out th that um, the the you, you they were not able to measure individual masses for neutrino but the difference in 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 every two pairs of of the, of the neutrino so it's called the delta mass so this delta mass when you write down the mathematical equation it actually depends on the difference in phase of the wavelengths or the difference in in the frequency of the oscillation as well and then we know that neutrinos do have mass there is a certain difference in mass between every pair of neutrinos but we don't know the absolute scale of of neutrinos um, and that's what I know um, all right everyone uh, I think uh, I'm gonna call it it for today but I, I I had a very nice time talking to you about these stories interesting stories thank you so much for for all your questions and for all your comments uh, certainly appreciate all your interaction it makes it uh, a lot of fun and uh, once again well thank you so much for watching and uh, this has been the Daily Space, a production of CosmoQuest, uh, created by the Astronomical Society of the Pacific. And if you like this show, please give us a follow, or if you want to sustain our efforts more, uh, please consider subscribing and telling your friends about us, and um, posting about us on social media so we get more followers and views. That'd be great. And uh, we will be back tomorrow. And um, every day of the week, of course, at 1 p.m. Easter, 10 a.m. Pacific, and 6 p.m. London. All right, everyone. See you tomorrow. Bye-bye.